This episode of Inside Fashion is brought to you in partnership with PayPal, the most trusted buy now, pay later brand, according to a recent survey, which gives merchants access to PayPal's 403 million users worldwide. Learn more at paypal.com slash paylaterenterprise. We make stuff, we use stuff, and we want it to go away, and we take new material and we go, repeat that process. But not built into that process is that circularity or that the design intent for it to be recycled and reused in the first place. I haven't seen a scientific, more precise way of looking at what exactly we're consuming and how much resource in terms of material, energy, water, all this stuff that we're consuming in the process of making these products. Hi, this is Imran Ahmed, founder and CEO of The Business of Fashion. Welcome to the BOF podcast. It's Friday, September 10th. The modern fast-paced fashion industry feeds a culture of waste that results in millions of tons of textiles burnt or sent to landfill every year. Brands are beginning to acknowledge the problem, labeling products with buzzwords like circularity and creating bags made from recycled fishing nets or shoes crafted from plastic bottles. But the industry still needs to find scalable solutions to its overall waste problem. This week on the BOF Podcast, our chief correspondent Lauren Sherman speaks with the chief executive of the Hong Kong Research Institute of Textiles and Apparel, Edwin Kay, about ways that fashion can tackle the waste challenge. Here's Edwin Kay, Inside Fashion. So this is a a very big topic. And I think what would be good to do is I want to talk about the specific work that you do. I think a lot of people in our audience are going to be fascinated and inspired by it. But first, can we talk about big picture? Waste means a lot of things in fashion. We think about excess inventory. We think of landfills filled with clothes, et cetera, et cetera. But it affects every single part of the process of making a garment. Can you talk a bit about why it's such a problem and or an issue and how it affects the the entire fashion ecosystem? Right, right. So so um, it, it, you're right, it's a big topic. And the waste that we usually see or talk about, at, at least as consumers, is really the prover- proverbial tip of the iceberg, right? That's the stuff that's left over. But if you think about all the byproducts that are created in the process of making your garment, the, the agricultural byproducts when you grow whatever material you're growing, or the, the petroleum byproducts if you're using a synthetic material, and then the, 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 the water, uh, the dye stuff that you use, and then you discharge to color the material, uh, and then the cutting waste and, and all, the, uh, all the stuff that's left on the floor of, of the factory, and then all the all the supporting packaging material, you know, the plastic bags and the boxes and, and, the, and the cartons that are, are put in for transportation purposes. And then you have the garment itself, which if you look at sort of the gross weight or the net weight of it, it, it is actually a fraction of all that stuff that has happened already. And then there is the, the useful life of the product, right? Um, we used to hang on to, to clothes a lot longer. Now, things have a, a much shorter useful life. Um, we don't use it as often and, and we, we dispose of it a lot faster. So then we come to the post-consumer portion of the materials that now have to be dealt with. You're very right about talking about just that word waste. I mean, is it is it waste? Because all this stuff is, is they're all useful material and they all have value. And we call it waste just because we're discarding so many things. There's this stat that goes around and I'm sure it'll brought up, be brought up a million times today about how it's wrong that fashion is the second most polluting industry or something like that, that there's no, you know, there's not a real, is there any way to measure how much waste the industry actually is making or, or as you said, excess, because I think you're right that we, as humans, we want to kind of clean everything up and clear it and, and act like it didn't exist, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have any value. But is, is there any way to measure the impact of all this excess material that we have at you know the beginning, middle, and end of these processes. Well, that, that's all part of the problem too. There, there really has, I, or at least I haven't seen a, a scientific, more precise way of looking at what exactly we are consuming and, and how much resource in terms of material, 
energy, water, all this stuff that we're consuming in the process of making these, these products. And so that's why you have these great disagreements or these wildly varying numbers about what exactly is going on, because there, there isn't anything going on. Uh, there, there isn't any precise measurement. And I think one of it, one of the reasons for that is that our rate of consumption of apparel, garments, and, and the materials for it has been going up so rapidly in the last decade or two that once upon a time, it really was not that big of an issue. It just, it just wasn't something that, that it, it is too trivial almost for us to measure because we just hang on to stuff. But now we, we have this, this, we've changed our attitude and our relationship with, with our apparel. It went from a durable to a disposable or a consumable. And, and then all this waste began to appear. I'd love to kind of dig deep into the topic of recycled materials, because that's something that, that you have been studying and working on and, and making progress on for many years now. And when I think when a lot of consumers think about, yes, we see recycled cotton occasionally at a big box retailer now, and they have lots of marketing around it. It's very exciting or you know, organic cotton, if, if it's organic and recycled, even better. But, you know, when I think of something like a recycled material, I'm thinking of something that maybe doesn't have a great hand feel that is textured and has a lot of um, yeah. blemishes or what have you. Can you talk a bit about the work that you've been doing to, to specifically improve recycled material, the kind of machines developed and, and the kind of work you've done with bigger businesses on using these types of materials and why, why it's so important. So there, there's, when we talk about recycled materials, there's every stage of that manufacturing process. There are opportunities to pick up materials that we're not using today or, or discarding today and, and use them. So there is industrial waste and there is con, uh, a post-consumer waste, if you will. So, so there are lots of materials there. Um, so that's one challenge is, is kind of defining where it's coming from and what it is exactly. Uh, two, I think when we talk about recycling today, we really are trying to deal with a problem that somebody else created some time ago. And, and we're sort of trying to retrofit a solution into a problem that appeared. And, and the, the way I, uh, the reason why I think about it that way is, is first of all, fundamentally today, if you look at our fashion apparel supply chain, it is still linear in shape. You know, we, we make stuff, we use stuff, and, it, and we want it to go away and we take new material and, and we go, repeat that process. But not built into that process is that circularity or that the design intent for it to be recycled and reused in the, for, in the first place. So, so we have that challenge, which is fundamentally, we, we, are, we, we, we have this, this, this uh, one way uh, direction uh, of, of our supply chain. And, and then secondly, uh, in terms in terms of how apparel is built today, a lot of apparel is built without thinking about how am I going to reuse this? How am I going to uh, um, dismantle it so that I can make something else out of it? And so what happens is that we make it very difficult for things to be recycled because it's blended, because it is uh, put together in a way that uh, um, with other mixed materials or, or assembled in a way that it is very difficult to, to break apart. So those create challenges for us. What, you know, I go back to this idea of durables and consumables. Once upon a time, we don't have to think about that because we tend to hang on to, to our clothes for a really, really long time. And so it doesn't lend itself to be a, to be a big problem. Why recycling has become more and more of, a, of an opportunity for us is because we aren't thinking of our apparel as durable. We, we are throwing things away. And because we have these ever um, more and more rapid uh, cycles of fashion, uh, and these cycles of fashions are shorter than the useful life of the material that our apparel uh, are, are made from. And so it creates this opportunity for us to think about recycling. So what are, what are you doing specifically? Can you talk a bit about the work that you've done with the H&M group? Because I think that's, that's a really unique project. And 
and these machines that have been developed, if a business like Monkey can use them, does that mean that every every scaled business could could use them? We we work specifically with the H and M Foundation, uh, or the H and M Foundation came to us about six years ago, and and uh, we have had a research partnership with them. Uh, they are by no means the only brand uh, that we have partnership and, and research partnerships with. We also work with with other brands, but they certainly have been the the most interested in in uh, looking at recycling. So for the last uh, five years, uh, our first series of projects with them is around uh, recycling and, and specifically recycling methodology. And and what we want to do is to look at it a lot more holistically. We are, we are an applied research center. But when we look at something like like a, a challenge of recycling, it's a, you, you can't look at it out of context. If you solve the science problem and you don't make the business case for it, or you don't create the logistics for it, then you you have sort of like a, a half baked solution that uh, makes you feel good or works well in the lab, but doesn't have a real world application. So we have been looking at first of all just. What are the different methods of recycling? And is there a business case that we can make with one of them? So we look at mechanical recycling, which you mentioned earlier, you know, hey, look, you end up paying more money for a something that is not as comfortable and you have to compromise on, on some of the aesthetics. Uh, so uh, then, well, then we looked at biological systems, which, and we're still on that. Uh, uh, we're using fermentation and different enzymes to separate, break down, and transform materials uh, into uh, either separating them or, or transforming them into other useful materials that we can re reuse in uh, for for garment applications. So that work is ongoing. And then we we looked at uh, chemical recycling, which in recent years have become quite um, a, uh, a a domain that there's a lot of interest. A lot of people see that uh, uh, chemical recycling as the the uh, with the highest opportunity. For for uh, developing some useful, efficient uh, uh, recycling methods, and we went down that road for for about three years. But we kept coming up with uh, the problem of creating new problems when we solve an old problem, which is we we, we create uh, a a chemical waste stream that we now have to deal with. And so um, we say, well, that probably shouldn't be that that's part, that's not a very elegant solution is there something that that works better and so we started taking chemistry out of out of uh, our chemical recycling uh, efforts uh, um, and so we ended up with this this uh, breakthrough that we announced uh, uh, about uh, 18 24 months ago called the hydrothermal system which is using heat and pressure to separate uh, blended material and and recover from from it uh, um, useful material which are uh, without any deterioration to the to the look, the hand feel, or the or the characteristic of the material, uh, and at the same time, um, new useful raw materials for other types of new uh, um, yarns and fibers that we can we can reuse again. Uh, so that uh, so and and I can go on. There's a lot of interesting byproducts that came out of that, but but that that's sort of uh, one group of experiments that we're, we're very excited about. Yeah, that's, it's really exciting. And, you know, when you talk about the business case, how much more expensive is it for a company to use the kind of methods that you're using versus just buying new fabric? And if, if it is more expensive, how do you kind of explain to them the, the reason for doing it? That's always the, been the challenge, right? We are we are using recycled materials out of the goodness of our heart, if you will, not because it's more comfortable or cheaper, and and so we want to solve that. We don't want people to use recycled material out of the goodness of their heart. So hence, why we're excited about this. So so first of all, we are almost at par in terms of the cost for comparable material, uh, virgin to recycle uh, on, on the polyester side. So so the, the the monkey collection is is the first one out of this. And uh, we have scaled it from a small pre-industrial scale system, about 150 uh, kilos a day, which is what we're operating right now, to a one and a half ton to two ton a day system, an industrial scale system, which is um, as soon as we can get visas in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the era of the pandemic that we're in, 
uh, uh, we would be installing in, in a manufacturing facility and it will go live and start producing uh, uh, live materials. And it, un, if we don't label it as a consumer, if you pick up the garment, you will not know the difference. The, the, on, on the polyester side, whatever materials that go in to be treated in the hydrothermal system comes out in exactly the same um, state. There's no de mechanical, there's no uh, um, deterioration in performance, there's no difference in hand feel. And, and we have gotten the, the, the cost of that down to incremental difference. And, and this was, uh, and so we started this industrial scale project in uh, December of 2019. And with the pandemic delays, we, we are we're on the cusp of, of turning this thing on. And we, we think this is a, a, a tremendous scale up opportunity. But then we have been creating this series of, of other useful outputs with this uh, that we are also very excited. Uh, we we have um, on, on the on the uh, natural material on the cellulosic side material. We have uh, developed a new type of viscose material. We have been able to use the cellulosic material to to develop a um, PFC free uh, water repellent treatment for for uh, uh, so so the PFC free DWR treatment. Uh, is the geek term. Uh, and then also we announced last November a successful first experiment to use the cellulosic material, which we functionalized into a new polymer uh, in, uh, as, a, as a way to grow cotton uh, without irrigation. So, uh, so we, that, is, that is being scaled up uh, and we are looking at irrigation-free cotton. We are also adding more functionality to these recycled cellulosic particles so that um, it doesn't, it, it has nutrients in it. So we, we don't have to add fertilizer. And we're looking at sort of like a beyond organic uh, type of, of, of cotton, um, which grows faster, uh, yields more per acre and has longer fibers. So, so all sort of, we're, we're very excited. And, and we think that there's a lot of opportunities. Um, uh, and, and all of this is to is to make the the, the business case for this, so that so that uh, we recycle uh, because it's 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 not only it's a do well do good uh, type of a business proposition. Yeah, I mean, we could talk. I, I'm so interested if the industry just skips skips over organic cotton and goes straight to your solution, but that's probably another conversation. Before we open to questions, I do wanna ask you about the consumer's behavior. You mentioned that, that the monkey project, there's not gonna be, a, a, it's not gonna be labeled or, or what have you with recycled materials. I think this is something that, you know, it's very difficult if you do a survey and you ask consumers, Yes, I would like my products to be, I want to buy less and save more or what have you. And, and I want to wear my clothes forever. I want to invest. They'll all say that they want to do that. The, the way that people act and, and the way their intentions are often very different. But I'm curious to know from you, you know, especially over the last year and a half, how has consumer behavior changed and how do you see that like talking about the business imperative of of these sorts of changes in in the operating model, um, how has the consumer's behavior changed? I, do you think permanently, and and what does that have to do with the work that you're doing and the work to make the industry more circular? Right, right, right. right. Let me speak about that in in, in more general terms um, about the the consumer how, how the consumer has changed, especially through the pandemic. One of the things that we, we observe is that consumers are now much more uh, engaged. I, I think you're right. There is still an inconsistency with what consumers say and what they do, how they spend, how they consume. And, and, and I, I don't really, the onus is not so much on the consumer. I don't think we as an industry have done a very good job at giving point of sale information that is helpful to consumers to make uh, consumption decisions about, hey, if you buy, a uh, product A versus product B. Here is the carbon footprint. Here's what you're you're doing, and and here's how you can make a difference. We don't have that. We don't have the nutrition label, if you will, of 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 that of, of the the products that we sell. And and so it's on us to to be better at at working on that communication. 
consumers through the pandemic have a, a, a changed relationship with 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 uh, the garments. Garments are now um, more functional than their aesthetic. Um, consumers want to make a difference with how they consume. You you can see it by the the, the, the logos that they want on their chest uh, to, to 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 speak about how that um, aligns with with their value system. And I think the other th interesting change is that consumers that we have seen or that we have talked to want to be part want to be a lot more active. They want to be part of the solution. They don't want to just be a a victim or a bystander of what is going around. So so uh, the connection between personal health and the health of the planet is something that is very um, uh, very powerfully brought uh, uh, brought to light with the pandemic, you know, what happens to you and what happens to your community, it's kind of sort of an, uh, an extension of the same thing. So, so, so we, we, we think this is, this is really good. This, this would really, uh, uh, there is that will. So, so how can we support that by, by giving the tools and by giving the options to, to the uh, consumer as well too. Uh, and, and, and I'll also add that today, just by saying that, oh, we, we have recycled content, we, we're kind of green as a brand, uh, it doesn't, doesn't you, you don't stick out from the crowd. Everybody has something like that. You, you Now the demand uh, from the consumer, expectation for consumers is also higher. You have to be not only not one of the bad guys, you have to be one of the good guys, right? So, so what are you doing uh, for, for, for climate change? What are, what are you doing to, to be carbon negative? Uh, what are you doing so that you can be much more regenerative or, or uh, supporting biodiversity? I, th I think all those are, are now front and center questions for, for, for the industry. And how much does discounting culture and, and, you know, in the last year and a half, a lot of very, very large apparel retailers have really dialed back on discounting many at the high end, but also at the middle have increased their prices in the middle, a lot of them by 25% would have you. They're talking a lot about less promotion in the US. That's a huge, huge issue, but in Europe, and I think in, in Asia as well, increasingly, how does the discounting culture and the, the attempt to pull away from that factor into this circularity? Why do businesses need to do that in order to get away from, from discount? Yeah, yeah, and, and and that also, by the way, going back to your original first question, that also is waste, right? Stuff that you make that nobody wants to buy, and and I think that the challenge in in that the pandemic also put a spotlight on is that we are in a fast changing dynamic marketplace globally, and and so it is getting harder and harder to to predict consumer demand uh, using the existing models. Uh, and and working in the in the calendars that we have been working to, uh, consumers are are much more. Um, they they really want things to be relevant and useful, and, and they really want these products to track with their lifestyle changes. So in the uh, in the pandemic, it's quite obviously that comfort over over aesthetics and things like that. So so there there's a there's a lot of opportunity to work on more intelligent ways. To, to, to do uh, analytics and to do predictives with consumers. And, and so th that's another uh, uh, a great opportunity not to make a mistake in the first place. Yeah, so we have time for one question and, and quite a few people in the audience, including Sarah from Chicago and some other people have mentioned this. Policy, government, framework, how important is it in terms of regulating this stuff that, that different governments that produce a lot of product or consume or con countries that consume a lot of product create some sort of policy to help move these initiatives through and make make change. I, I think it's a combination of of uh, government leadership, uh, political leadership, and then creating the, the the incentives, the tax and the and the and the pricing incentives. But and that's where you you start, but. I think then you ha the industry will have to take a, a lot of um, initiative then, then to, to drive that into, into the way we do business. I think fundamentally, uh, one way to look at the, the issue with waste is that we are mispricing uh, uh, the, the, the materials that we use. We, we, we're just not uh, holding users accountable to the total cost 
of, 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 of uh, using and disposing of, of this material. So we need to, to do a lot of that. Uh, but very soon thereafter, I think, I think business purpose and, and business uh, um, values will have to follow through that, that we, we have to be a, uh, an industry for good and, and, and a business that, that, is, uh, that is supportive of, of, a, of a much more healthy uh, marketplace. Edwin, thank you so much. I could talk to you for another two hours. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to the BOF podcast for our look inside fashion and how it connects to currents in the wider world. If you're not yet a BOF professional member, join today with our 30-day risk-free trial and benefit from exclusive access to agenda-setting analysis you won't find anywhere else. The BOF podcast is edited and produced by Emma Clark, Kate Bartan, and Kevin Bobby Blanco in the BOF studio team.